Good evening. My name is Jody. I'm a community educator um, with Boulder Community Health. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture on battling women's heart disease. Before we begin, I need to make a few announcements. Please take a moment at this time to silence your cell phones to avoid interruptions to our lecture. We would also very much appreciate it if you remember to fill out the evaluation form we gave you in your packet of handouts. We look at these very closely when planning future events. Also, I want to let you know that BCH has moved to a new electronic record called EPIC. EPIC provides quicker access to patient information, which means BCH doctors and nurses can coordinate your care better. One of the big benefits of EPIC is a great online portal that's really popular with patients. The portal lets you do things like view test results, message your care team, and much more. We call the portal MyBCH. You can access it from your computer or get an app on, for your phone. You can sign up the next time you're at a BCH for a patient care service, or you can register today using the MyBCH website or smartphone apps listed on the flyer you received during registration. Finally, I'd like to go over the format for the lecture. The lecture portion will last about 45 minutes. Afterwards, we'll take about 15 minutes to answer general questions. Please limit your questions to general ones that the whole group can benefit from hearing. On behalf of the Boulder Community Health, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Molly Ware. Dr. Ware is board certified in cardiovascular medicine, echocardiography, and nuclear cardio cardiology. She received her bachelor's degree in anthropology from Harvard University and her medical degree from the University of Colorado School in Medicine, of Medicine, excuse me, where she was presented with the gold-headed cane award for promise as an outstanding physician. She went on to complete her residency at Brig Big Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and then completed a three-year fellowship in cardiovascular medicine at Boston Medical Center. Dr. Ware sees patients at Boulder Health on the Foothills Hospital Medical Campus. She treats all types of cardiovascular disease and has a special interest in heart valve problems, preventative cardiology, and cardiac issues in women and athletes. Please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Ware. Thank you so much, that was very nice. How's the sound? Dan, we good? Excellent. It's great to be here, and I really appreciate everyone coming out. I know it's cold, I know it's snowy, so it's good to see everyone. I have given this lecture many times, especially in February, because it is heart month, and I always look it over, make sure we're up to date, and what I really love about this lecture is a lot of it is getting back to basics which I think is really important in this day and age. Medicine is moving quickly. There's a lot of new technology and research and devices and very amazing things that we can do. But sometimes it's nice to just review basics, and I think that's an important part of overall health. Today's focus is on cardiac disease in women, but a lot of what I will talk about pertains to everyone. So thanks for being here. We're going to review a little bit about the numbers, you know, how much heart disease impacts people in this country. We're gonna talk about what do I mean when I say heart disease, and how we look for heart disease. The meat of the talk is really about preventing heart disease and things that we can do every day that reduce our risk of having a problem. A little bit about some tests that we do. So, Heart disease is the most common cause of death in women in the United States. Six times the number of deaths from heart disease as deaths from breast cancer. This does not mean that breast cancer is not prevalent, but we're talking about mortality. So almost 400,000 cardiovascular deaths per year in women, one death per minute, which really translates into one out of, Dan, are we good? Okay, it's hard for me to tell. Speak up, guys, if you can't hear me. 
Uh, so one out of three women will ultimately die of cardiovascular disease. It's a big deal. 44 million in the United States carry a diagnosis, but a lot more people are walking around undiagnosed. And since the mid-80s, there have been more cardiovascular deaths in women than in men. Unfortunately, two-thirds of people with sudden cardiac death didn't have any warning signs, which is kind of a scary statistic. And younger women are affected too. I think historically, heart disease was thought of as a disease of older men. But as a cardiologist, I see all sorts of people, both genders, or I guess all genders, um, and young people and older people too. And as I mentioned, you know, there are ethnic differences too. Uh, women of Hispanic descent develop cardiovascular disease on average 10 years earlier than Caucasian women, and African American women have a higher risk of hypertension and stroke. So we need to keep these things in mind too. What is heart disease? It's a very big term. Today we're gonna to talk mostly about problems with the arteries of the heart, the plumbing. But people can have problems with the valves of the heart, and I'm gonna show you a little picture, um, or the electrical system. So plumbing, pump, or electricity. Today's mostly about the plumbing though. This is a cartoon of the heart. The vessels that run over the surface of the heart are called the coronary arteries, and they carry blood to the heart muscle itself, and blood leaves the heart and goes out to the body through the aorta. So today we're talking primarily about coronary arteries, blockages in the arteries. How do we detect it, and how do we prevent it? So what do we need to know? Classically, we're taught that heart disease or angina or heart pain related to blockages is a squeezing pressure in the center of the chest. That's classic. But there are a lot of other symptoms that people can have that are less typical. And this is an important part of the lecture. You may have heard that women often present or seek medical care for symptoms that aren't quite the same or not textbook. And I wanna just create some public awareness around that. So sometimes people are simply short of breath and they have no chest pain. Or they may not have chest pain, but they might have jaw pain or arm pain or back pain. Sometimes people have nausea without a lot of chest pain. Unusual sweating, not I went for a run and I was sweating, but out of the blue, clammy sweats, or just an overall feeling of unwell, um, fatigue, lightheaded. This is not to be alarmist, so if you are fatigued and lightheaded, it does not mean you are having a heart attack. My point is it's not always chest pain. So if someone's having new symptoms without a clear explanation, it's very reasonable to get checked. We, we see a lot of people in the ER and they end up not having a heart thing but we'd rather see them in the ER and they not have a heart thing than have a heart thing at home and we never see them because they didn't make it to the ER. So, word of caution. There is a lot of mention in our cardiology literature about women presenting later, meaning they had some symptoms but they didn't go see their doctor or they didn't go to the emergency room or they didn't really think that they needed to. Why is that? I mean, it's definitely a difference between men and women in terms of seeking care. A lot of reasons. I think sometimes these atypical symptoms aren't a warning sign to people, like, oh, maybe I just had a bad meal or I'm getting the flu, and they don't think it could be their heart. Or it's really not that bad, I'll deal with it later. Because women don't really have heart disease, it's really a men's disease. And I have a lot to do. <laughs> I have kids, grandkids, work, things, obligations. I don't, I don't know. I don't wanna go to the ER and then have it be nothing. And we hear this all the time. We hear this all the time. And I wanna emphasize this isn't just women that have, can have atypical symptoms, but that tends to be the trend. But it's important for everyone to realize this. And we know, statistically, that more women than men die of sudden cardiac death, so that sudden death without any warning symptoms. If someone has a heart attack and they're female, 
their chance of dying after the heart attack is higher than if they're male. There's differences in the, the vessels and the way that plaque is formed in the vessels and sometimes the differences in blood pressure that lead to this higher mortality. And despite efforts and improved education and, and more women being involved in research studies, still in 2020, there's often suboptimal treatment of women despite guideline therapy. So we are working on that. I'm gonna show a little video, cartoon from the internet, I didn't make it, um, of what happens during a sudden heart attack. Hey, this is working, thank you. Cool. So here's one of the arteries, the left anterior descending artery, and it's gonna focus in here. We're gonna see a cross section of the artery with some plaque in the artery. Plaque is kind of like a blister. It's, it's a buildup of cholesterol and a lot of other inflammatory cells and activated white blood cells. And that plaque can rupture open and cause a clot because the body doesn't like foreign material. So if a plaque ruptures open, kind of like a blister hot spot, it can cause a clot and decreased blood flow to the heart, and a heart attack. I think I did it. Um, so how does this happen, and how can we avoid it? Well, as I just mentioned briefly, it's not just having high cholesterol, and then you're going to have a plaque. Or it's not just having diabetes, and then you're going to get a plaque. There's a lot of factors that go together to form a plaque in the artery of the heart. And we know that inflammation is key here. So if someone has inflammation inside their arteries, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later, and they have a lot of cholesterol floating around, a plaque can form, and that plaque can become unstable. When does the plaque become unstable? Often with a spike in blood pressure, a very large meal, a lot of stress, smoking a cigarette, so there are certain triggers for this plaque rupture, and sometimes we just don't know. Sometimes exercise can cause that plaque to rupture. Because as stress hormones go up, the inflammation goes up, and things become a little bit more unstable in the arteries. So as mentioned, talking a lot about today, plaque, buildup in the arteries, but there are other types of heart attacks that are less common and primarily seen in women, so it's kind of perfect for this talk. Some people have something called a coronary artery spasm, where the artery literally just tightens down and decreases blood flow temporarily, and that doesn't have to do with plaque. There's something called spontaneous coronary artery dissection. I've never seen it occur in a man, and I've seen it in several women. It's not a common thing, but it can happen around the time of giving birth, it can happen around the time of menopause, and it probably has to do with hormonal shifts where the artery actually tears. So this is different than a plaque. And there's another thing called stress cardiomyopathy or a stress-induced heart attack. If someone gets very bad news or is in a terrible accident, their heart can actually be stunned for a period of several days and not work well. So there's a lot of really unusual things that can happen. And I will say, based on my own personal clinical experience, that these are much more common in women than men. Wow. Plaque rupture, sudden death. Oh my god, what do I do? There's a lot that we can do to prevent this. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about screening, meaning feeling fine, not having symptoms, what can we do to make sure that we're reducing our risk? And we're going to talk a little bit about diagnosis. I would rather not have anyone have a heart attack and just work on all these risk factors than have to see people in the ER and go to the cath lab and deal with the aftermath. So that's why it's the meat of the talk is really about prevention tonight. So we know, and we've known for 50 years based on starting with this study called the Framingham Heart Study, which followed people and their descendants over decades, that things like 
high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking cigarettes, and marijuana, um, or a family history, genetics, being a bit older, being overweight, and not exercising, having kidney disease. All of these things increase the risk of inflammation in the heart and plaque formation. There are other emerging factors that we know increase risk as well. If someone, I'll get there in a second. Hmm. I'm sure the slide I'm looking for is coming up soon, but I thought it was there. We'll get there. Um, so there are things that we can do that identify this plaque before it causes a problem. So we call that preclinical screening. You may have heard of a heart scan or a coronary artery calcium scan. We usually would do that in someone who's never had a heart attack or a stent, but we want to know if they have plaque in their heart so we can get more aggressive with their treatment. Um, sometimes we do special blood work to understand a little bit more about someone's cholesterol. Um, and we often measure inflammation in the body because we know that inflammation is linked to heart disease. Occasionally, we'll do an ultrasound of someone's carotid artery to see if there's any plaque there, because if there's plaque and cholesterol buildup in one part of the body, there's probably plaque in another part of the body too. This is a picture of, it's a CAT scan, so you're looking up at the person from their feet, and this is their heart. This white material here, the arrows pointing to it, and all of this white, is actually plaque buildup. It shouldn't be there at all. And this is a picture of that ultrasound of the neck vessels that I was talking about. This is actually a nice, beautiful neck vessel without much plaque buildup. The blood's just flowing in here, and there's not any irregular plaque buildup here. This slide is about the inflammation. I've talked about that a lot already. So what can we do to decrease inflammation in our bodies? Well, it's kind of a summary of the previous slide. Again, people with high blood pressure, overweight who smoke or have unfavorable cholesterol. We'll talk a little bit about hormones later. Um, or have chronic infections or chronic inflammation like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Those folks are more inflamed and more likely to develop those plaques. Decreased levels of inflammation are seen. I'm going to do a caveat here in one moment, but we know that people who exercise regularly, who maintain a good weight, and then certain medications can decrease their levels. Alcohol is interesting because we, as a medical community, used to say, you should have a glass of wine every day. It's really good for your heart. It's going to be great. And there's a lot of other problems with alcohol, so I no longer give that blanket recommendation. Um, in some people, moderate alcohol intake may overall reduce their cardiac risk, but there's other stuff we do, and alcohol has other problems, so I tend to not make that recommendation anymore. But it can overall reduce risk. If you don't start drinking, I don't recommend, I mean, if you don't drink now, I don't say, go start drinking. So it's a little nuanced in terms of that recommendation. This is the slide I was looking for. Thanks for bearing with me. So we now know a lot more than we did about five or 10 years ago. And people who have sleep apnea or women who have polycystic ovarian disease or people who have lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, or Raynaud's or migraines, other vascular type diseases, gout is an inflammatory condition, those people are also at increased cardiovascular risk. So when we're meeting someone and understanding the medical history, we take all that into account. Again, it doesn't mean that if you've had one gout attack in your life, you're gonna have a heart attack, but it's important to understand all of these things that can come together and affect people. I always take a pregnancy history when I'm meeting a female patient for the first time and she's had children, because if someone has had high blood pressure during pregnancy or develop diabetes, that person's at risk of developing heart disease later in life. Um, there are certain types of chemotherapy. I see a lot of breast cancer patients who have had um, 
certain cardiotoxic chemotherapies, meaning the chemotherapy itself has affected the heart muscle, and radiation to the chest can affect the heart valves and the heart vessels. So again, we're taking all of this into account when we're trying to understand what people's heart health is. Well, now you're all gonna run out and get heart scans and blood tests and want all this done. And not everyone needs all of this testing. I think the most important thing is to understand where you are. Um, you know, the classic things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, those still stand. So we need to know about all of that. And then the newer things too, if it's part of your medical history, you need to talk to your doctor about it. And then people who have a few risk factors but have never had a heart attack, we probably should get the special labs or do the heart scan. But I'm not recommending that for everybody. Primary prevention, right? We need to start in childhood and adolescence with healthy habits. I like, I think this is from the New Yorker, probably. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. I think it's a New Yorker cartoon. I found it a long time ago. So, what is healthy? What are good numbers? You know, what do we need to keep in our heads? And the recommended blood pressure is 120 or over 80 or less. Really, anything above that is considered high blood pressure. And lower is probably better. Um, the LDL cholesterol, when you get your panel, the LDL is the bad cholesterol, and we like that less than 100. And we like the good cholesterol greater than 50. Triglycerides less than 150. You do that, there will not be a quiz, but you have this in your packet. Um, and it's nice to be a normal weight, um, not too thin, not too big. Body mass index can be calculated by this kilograms over meter squared. I'm not gonna do the math right now, but we talk, even though we're in the US, for some reason body mass index is in the metric system. Um, and having a waist circumference for females under 35 inches and you measure that at your belly button. If someone has diabetes, we like to keep their blood sugar nice and low, and hemoglobin A1C is less than 7%. If you have diabetes, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so again, we need to know what our numbers are, what our starting point is for cholesterol, and then potentially improve it or keep it good. So I'm gonna talk a bit about exercise here. Um, and I wanna change the focus a little bit and not say, you should exercise so that you keep a good weight and, and lose weight and keep your good blood pressure. I, I try to talk about exercise because it feels really good. And there's so many other benefits to exercise. Yes, maybe you'll lose weight or keep your weight. Yes, maybe you'll look better in a bathing suit. But that's not why I think people should exercise. It's, it's you know, if, if you exercise regularly and then there's a week or two where you don't, you probably know what I mean and you just feel kind of bad, like depressed and achy. So I, I like to try to help people find what they love to do. And not everyone has to run a 5K. Not everyone has to go to the gym and lift weights. There's so many different ways to move. So I like to try to be creative with that and focus on the good it is and not just like you need to exercise so that you lose weight and you don't have heart disease. So that was a little bit of a, I think it's, a, I think it's one of the huge pillars of primary prevention, but sometimes doctors come, up, come at it a little bit prescriptively. So trying to get a little bit more positive about that. Um, there's so much data about the runner's high and the oxytocin and your muscles are an endocrine organ and when you exercise you actually relate better to people and you feel more positive and I could go on and on and that's not the point of the talk but it's really important to me that I share that with you. So it's, it's, a, it's probably, you know, if someone said, I have something you can do that's going to make your daily life better, make you live longer and reduce the risk of chronic disease, you'd probably all sign up for that. I present to you. Um, the data is very clear that people who are fitter live longer. Um, this is the, uh, when, we, when we look at people and they walk on a treadmill in our office, 
if they can make it to nine minutes on our protocol versus two minutes or three minutes, those people are gonna do better, even if they've had heart problems. So fitter is better. I was an anthropology major, as I think was mentioned. So I also like this cartoon because, you know, we've really technologically advanced well beyond the Paleolithic era, but our bodies haven't. You know, we need to use them and we need to move and they feel weird when we don't. So um, we used to have to exercise in order to survive and now we can just basically sit all day and eat fast food and you don't actually need to move. So I like to remind of where we came from. Um, and this is just a little bit of my kind of, again, you know, why are we, why are we exercising? And maybe thinking about different ways to get motivated. Oh, Dr. Ware told me I needed to walk 30 minutes a day. Sure, that would be awesome, but there's so, how did the slide come out? I'm curious. Cool. There's so many forms of movement and exercise and yoga and tai chi and group exercise and exercising with disabilities. It's just like endless, endless possibilities. So I like to help people figure that out. Um, switching gears here because this is, a talk about women. I'm not gonna talk a lot about, or at all, about testosterone supplementation. I know some women take it and some men take it. I'm really talking here about hormone supplementation in peri or postmenopausal women. Very controversial. Um, this is not comprehensive review. Um, we know that premenopausally, women have a lower risk of heart disease than their age-matched male counterparts. So up to 50, it is true that women are less likely to have a heart problem. But that changes after 50 or 55. So back in the 90s, we put everyone on hormones because we're like, well, if it was good then, it's gotta be good when you're 50 or 60, and that's not exactly true. Um, because a big study came out a long time ago, in 2002, showing that certain types of hormone replacement therapy actually were not good. They caused um, heart attacks and strokes and an increased risk of blood cancer. So everyone panicked, no one was on hormones, and a lot of people were really grumpy about it. So the truth probably lies somewhere in between, like most things in medicine. Um, I don't categorically say that postmenopausal women should not be on hormones, but we just need to have a very clear discussion about it and understand the benefits and the risks. So if someone's having terrible symptoms of menopause um, and they're relatively young and they're not 75, I would probably say it's okay for a shortish short -ish period of time at a low-ish dose. Um, if someone's actually had a blood clot or they've had a heart attack or they've had breast cancer, we really can't recommend hormone replacement therapy. Um, so probably some of the newer compounds that we have or the transdermal, like the sticker estrogen, I guess you would call it, are safer, but there's a lot we don't still know. There are a lot of small studies that are going on right now that hopefully will come out with a big new recommendation for us, but right now we're still working on that women's health initiative. So that's why it's very controversial and it's an individualized decision with you and your doctor based on your risk. The advantages of hormone therapy are reduced menopausal symptoms, better bone density, um, sometimes mood stability. There's a lot of advantages, so I don't categorically say no. Um, next topic is food, which is great, and I really try to, oh, I should have, I try to not use the word diet in my vocabulary because it's got such a, it's got a complicated connotation. So I like to talk about eating patterns and what makes you satisfied. And if we're gonna have to talk, if we're gonna label it, I am a fan of the Mediterranean style of eating because it basically doesn't have processed foods, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, lean proteins like fish and nuts, and you don't see any sort of boxes or bags here. So that's why I like Mediterranean style eating. We could talk for hours about keto and zone and paleo and gluten-free and is dairy bad for you, and I actually am very interested in nutrition, 
but I'll give you my highlights today. Um, I do think that fruits and vegetables are good for you. And not many people are, try to argue with me about that. One patient did once, and it was interesting. So, so when, you, when you really think about it, you can have pretty much as much vegetables and some fruit as you want in a day, and it's not gonna add up to that many calories, and you're gonna feel great, and it's very satisfying. And this, oh, wrong thing. Um, this is just a summary graph of the more fruits and vegetables that someone ate, their risk of having heart disease decreased. This was, I think, yeah, a nurse's health study. Like the exercise thing, let's think positively. You can have as much vegetables as you want in a day. I mean, that's so many options. That's so much food. Like, I'm not telling you to not, I'm telling you what to eat, not what not to eat, right? Um, and again, we don't, we're trying to get away from diet and we're talking about patterns. Like, let's reach for the carrots instead of reaching for the chips. I don't want to vilify chips, but carrots are better. So we're trying to be positive here. Um, a, a good friend of mine who's a colleague and also a really smart nutrition person has developed this program that you can find online. It's called the 800 Gram Challenge. And I, I've done it, it's pretty awesome. You have to eat 800 grams of fruits and vegetables in a day um, by weight. So like an orange is 100 grams or something. And it's actually really fun to try to find a variety to eat and it's a lot of food. You have to like work hard to do that. And then you realize, huh, I didn't have that cake and I didn't have that ice cream because I was too busy focusing on eating that apple that it was 150 grams. I think this is really cool. And like I said, if you just look it up online, you'll, you can read all about it. But it's kind of a nice tool for people. Um, I don't know any stock in it or anything. I just thought it was a nice tool. So even though we're not supposed to eat foods that come in a box or a bag, if you do buy processed foods, which we all do from, I, I buy cereal, I buy some things, look at the labels. Trans fats are no good, they're chemicals, they're made in a lab. Saturated fats tend to be atherogenic, meaning they promote the plaque formation. So we try to avoid a lot of saturated fat, which comes from animals, and avoid a lot of added sugar. So again, if we're looking at food labels, these are the highlights. I did say I wasn't gonna say don't eat certain foods, but I just thought this was really funny. And my 12-year-old daughter also thinks it's really funny, so I left it in. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip this because the fish oil story is interesting. Um, if the, real, the only real clear indication for taking supplemental fish oil is if you have very high triglycerides. And in fact, there's now a prescription um, fish oil that's doing really well in clinical trials. Some people just feel better when they take fish oil because they feel like it's anti-inflammatory but we don't have super strong recommendations about fish oil. I do have super strong recommendations about good fats. So fats from animals tend to be less healthy than, plat than fats from plants. Again, I'm not saying you all have to be vegetarian. I'm not a vegetarian. I try to eat less meat than I used to, um, but fruits and vegetables are good for you. And I think I said that before. Um, Another cartoon. So it's, you know, what we eat is important and also, you know, we do have to think how much we eat. So sitting down at the dinner table, if a lot of your plate has vegetables on it, maybe a lean protein or a vegetarian protein like tofu, and then a little bit of starch. That's, I think, a sweet potato. Um, and maybe it's a school lunch because there's a carton of milk, I don't know. But I like, I like the plate model where you're trying to fill up at least half your plate with vegetables. Um, I don't recommend a ton of supplements in terms of dietary supplements. I'd rather people just eat a lot of variety of good food, but multivitamins probably aren't a bad thing, and vitamin D3, because none of us are really out sunbathing much anymore. Um, calcium's an interesting thing, especially for women. I mean, I remember my doctor telling me you have to, you know, 2,000 milligrams a day or all of this, and we were all eating Viactive, and remember all that? Mm, not so much anymore, because we actually, there's a little bit of data that all that extra calcium might actually 
partly end up where we don't want it to, in the heart. Um, so if someone has bone disease and they need extra calcium because they've got osteoporosis, that's a different story. But for most people who have good bones and they've never had a fracture, um, most calcium should probably come from your diet. And it doesn't all have to be dairy. Leafy greens have calcium. Certain kinds of fish have calcium. So gets back to eating a good diet. Um, things we used to think were good aren't really good, like vitamin E, vitamin, vitamin C is neutral, but there are certain things where we used to promote it and now it's not worth it. So I don't think people need to spend a whole lot of time worrying about their supplements. I think I'd rather have you worry about what's the new kind of cool vegetable that I'm gonna have today. Um, of course, if someone is pregnant or may become pregnant, folic acid is important. That's a sideline. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, we talked about inflammation. We talked about people who have inflammatory conditions or at higher cardiac risk. But gum disease, which is not uncommon, can also promote cardiovascular disease, again, because of that inflammation link. So see your dentist regularly. Um, not being stressed is nice, but that's not realistic for all of us. But working on handling our stress and understanding what makes us stress, the, the stereotype of the, you know, the high-level executive running around and like dying of a heart attack, it's true. Stress hormones and running ragged and not getting enough sleep turns out aren't good for us. Um, there's data that heart attacks are more common in the morning. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but from six to noon, there tends to be this little spike in heart attacks. And my theory is that there's a cortisol surge and people are kind of rushing around and getting to meetings and it's kind of stressful. There's also less heart attacks in the summer, epidemiologically. It doesn't mean we don't see heart attacks all year round, but I think that has a lot to do with people are more relaxed on vacation, maybe getting some more exercise. So I'm not trying to be glib and say, don't be stressed. <laughs> but realizing that chronic stress is a risk factor for a lot of things, not just heart disease. Um, so I'm wrapping up here and we'll have some time for questions. What time is it? Oh, okay. Yeah, I've done this before. Um, so we basically talked all about primary prevention. You need to know your blood pressure, you need to know your cholesterol, you need to exercise because you love it, and all of that. But people can live perfectly and have heart attacks. So it's not, there's no blame, it's just that sometimes people have heart disease and they did everything right. So it's not about like, oh, if only you had more broccoli, you wouldn't have a heart disease. So sometimes we, people need meds. Yes, people need statins. And I know that no one likes statins, and statins got a bad rap in the lay press, but statin drugs, Lipitor, Crestor, those types of things, are to cardiovascular disease like penicillin was to infectious disease 100 years ago. They really revolutionized outcomes. I mean, people are living longer with less heart disease. A lot to do with statins. So some people need statins and good exercise and diet and not smoking. So it's not one or the other. Um, we obviously, I deal with a lot of people with high blood pressure or diabetes. So aspirin, I'm gonna say a word here. A Couple months ago in the New York Times, there was the article about now no one needs aspirin. Well, that wasn't exactly, that's not the message. Not everyone needs aspirin, but some people do need aspirin. So if you're wondering whether you should be on aspirin or not, it's a conversation with your doctor, but it also has to do with your overall risk, right? So a 55-year-old woman who doesn't have high blood pressure or diabetes or high cholesterol and who doesn't smoke probably doesn't need to take aspirin every day. A 75-year-old woman who's had a heart attack needs aspirin. Because remember that video I showed where the clot was forming inside the artery? Aspirin makes the platelets slipperier, so that clot is less likely to form. So 
the message that the lay press gave was, what your doctor told you was wrong and you don't need aspirin, so no, that's not true. It's, it's a conversation with your doctor about aspirin. Um, I'm gonna sort of, I'm just gonna skip through this because it's more about if someone gets diagnosed with heart disease or if we think they may have heart disease, what we do. We do stress tests in our office. We do cardiac catheterizations, which is an invasive test to look at the arteries. Um, I like to show this picture because it's, it's nice to learn a little anatomy. So the picture I showed in the beginning, that cartoon of the heart, this is a real heart. It's a CAT scan of a heart. And you can see the arteries coming down over the surface of the heart. So I think sometimes it's nice as a visual to really see what a heart looks like. By the way, your heart's about as big as your fist, which is pretty amazing to think that it basically sustains you your whole life almost without fail. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's incredible. Um, these are the arteries laid out here. You can see a little bit of plaque there. We've seen that before. That's the artery here. I just like it because it's kind of neat to see what a picture of the heart looks like. Um, so don't, don't despair. I mean, again, we talked a lot about primary prevention, um, but there's so much that we can do to help people recover after they've had a heart attack um, and not have another one, and it just is an ongoing process. So that was, that's just a little bit of a summary about what we can do to help you if you've already had a cardiac event. Um, I'm gonna leave this up. So I've said a lot of things and you have some information in your packet. Um, the takeaway is that heart disease is very, very common. I never have a dull day. <laughs> um, but as we learn more and as we have community talks, you all can be part of the solution too in terms of edu educating friends and family, understanding what heart healthy behaviors are. And again, it it's, remains frustrating to me, especially as a woman, that women and minorities tend to be underrepresented in research studies. So I think that that's a big important part of you know, the next push in research frontier. Um, you have this in your packet, but some websites that I think are really good, um, some books that I think are really good. There's, of course, many, many more that I can share with you, but um, I'll leave it at that. And thank you for listening. I would love to take any questions that anyone has. Thank you, Dr. Rare. That was amazing. Um, questions, we have microphones on both sides of the room. If you have any questions, please step up to the microwave. Or my, mic, <laughs> microwave. Are you hungry? Micro <laughs> All that food. <laughs> I know, right? Up to the microphones, and uh, Dr. Rare will address you. Thank you very We're going to alternate side to side. Oh, so we'll go first. Oh, well, I called on you, sir. Oh, oh. <laughs> I see what's happening. Uh, my question is, is there a role for meditation? Yes, 100%. And I, I actually toyed with putting a slide in, but then I thought, oh, I have too much going on. Did you say meditation? Meditation, not medication. Exactly. You know, thank you for bringing that up. I, I think it's amazing, actually. Um, because, first of all, it can't hurt. Right? We do a lot of things as physicians that are potentially harmful, like drugs have side effects, procedures have complications, but taking time every day to sit and focus or refocus and relax, and the data about the health benefits of meditation are overwhelming. Um, I've actually been learning a lot about this over the past year, and it's helped a lot of my patients. So I 100% would encourage you to do that. There's all sorts of apps. Um, in Boulder, we've got, anyone can pipe up here, but we've got Naropa and the Shambhala Center. I mean, you could find meditation teachers. Like I said, you can do it online. Um, in terms of stress reduction, blood pressure reduction, it's absolutely incredible. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. We're going to go over here now. 
So do you have any recommendations on one statin versus another being t more tolerated, especially with reference to like muscle aches? Right. So the question is about, do I recommend a specific statin over the others? And it's very individual. I tend, I'm not giving medical advice here, but I tend to use resuvastatin, which is Crestor, and atorvastatin, which is Lipitor, as my first line, because we can usually use a lower dose and get a nice LDL lowering with that at a lower dose. But I have a lot of folks who've been through three or four statins. They probably hate me. But, but sometimes it's sort of matching the physiology with the drug, and some people can tolerate one statin more than the other. I know I said I didn't really use supplements or like supplements, but vitamin D3 and coenzyme Q10 can help with muscle aching. Um, but again, it's, it's often pretty individual. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you mentioned sleep problems, you mentioned sleep apnea. So do other sleep problems, as in excessive wakefulness, uh, not being able to go to sleep or waking up really early, do they all have the bad effect? So my gut reaction is yes. We just have more data about the formal diagnosis of sleep apnea. But much as we talked about the pillars of health today being you know, exercise and stress reduction and diet, Honestly, sleep is over here waiting to just like come in and crush everything because we all have underestimated the importance of sleep, in my opinion, and it turns out to be insanely important. Like it's when your body, when your brain like gets rid of all the tangles in it and reduces the risk of dementia. It's when your body repairs itself. So yes, any sleep disorder probably isn't great for long-term health, which doesn't mean if you have three nights in a row where you have insomnia, you're gonna have a heart attack. But I do think that understanding the importance of regular uninterrupted sleep is really important. So it's a roundabout way of answering your question. We have more data on sleep apnea, but I just think any sleep disorder breathing is, I'm sorry, any sleep disruption is probably harmful if chronic. Yeah. yeah. I just have a question about calcium tests. So I know that <clears throat> I had one pr probably when they were kind of brand new. And it seems like, are they sort of a standard tool these days and reliable and all that kind of stuff? So the, the heart scan, which is basically a CAT scan of the chest that shows us if there's any plaque, it's not paid for by insurance. So that kind of gives you a sense of like, it's not standard, like they, they'll pay for, generally speaking, an EKG or a blood pressure check. Um, but it is being used more and more. But unlike getting your blood pressure or your cholesterol checked, it's not a universal screening test. So that's why people can self-refer for a calcium score and then we end up seeing them if their score is really high. But I don't recommend it to all of my patients, and I'm a cardiologist. So um, to answer your question, we use it as a tool in select patients to help us decide maybe you should be on a statin or aspirin, or let's get even more aggressive about trying to help you quit smoking, right? It kind of tips people in one direction or another, um, but it's certainly not an across-the-board recommendation. That was, one of my questions was exactly what is the heart scan that you get that measurement? Is like, like is it, how does it relate to like when you do the CT scan with contrast, for example? Right, so the picture I have up here is a CT scan with contrast. So this technically is not a picture of what a heart scan would look like, sort of similar. The CT scan with contrast actually opacifies the vessels themselves so we can tell how narrow they are. The heart scan, um, which is at the very beginning, and I don't know if I can find it now, basically it says, hey, there's some plaque there, and it gives us a number, which is a volume of plaque. Yeah. It's, 
it doesn't say, oh, your score is 350 Agatston units, which was the guy who invented it. It gives that number, but it doesn't say, and that means you have a 50% blockage. So it just says you have some plaque and how much you have, but sometimes people can have plaque lining the whole vessel, but not like a chunk of plaque in one spot. So that's why if someone's got a high calcium score, we would sometimes go on to do a stress test to see if the plaque that's there is impacting blood flow in the muscle of the heart. So does that help yeah. a bit? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you, what would be an abnormal stress test then? So a stress test is abnormal when there's a blockage that's 70% or more. So that chunk right there, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I obviously am not going to, I, I don't know, it looks like it might be about 50% blocked right there. Um, so if a vessel's blocked about 70%, we just know this from physiology, and someone does a stress test, it's probably, the stress test is probably going to be abnormal, meaning, they might have chest pain. They might have changes in the EKG. The EKG is that pink paper that comes out of the machine as we're going. Mm -hmm. uh, um, or if we do a special stress test, like a nuclear stress test, that would show up as a dark spot on the nuclear imaging. So the heart scan is anatomy, and the stress test is physiology. Yeah. In cardiology, we don't have one test that shows us everything at once. That would be amazing, but we don't. <laughs> we will might someday, but I don't know when. I'll be dead, probably. Yeah. Are you guys fighting over there? What's going uh, on over there? Yes, if you have um, a 91 LDL, is that, hi that that's high? Well... But is it relative to it's everything good. else? No. So we want our LDL to be below 100. So if, yours, if someone's is 91, uh -huh. that's great. When people have had a bypass surgery or a stent, we like to drive that even lower. Um, so there's less cholesterol bouncing around to build more plaque. But a score of 91 in someone who doesn't have established heart disease, I would say is pretty darn good. The LDL, mm -hmm. yeah. And what was my other question? <laughs> and I guess the other question was um, about aspirin then. Is that still advised yes. at that? Aspirin, I'm trying to find that slide. Sorry, guys. It probably says it, and I didn't remember. No, no, no. I want to put it up here so people know what I'm talking about. Um, so aspirin's good for some people. I think as a medical community, we used to say everyone over 55 should be on aspirin, and we don't... I can't find it. It's like early on in the presentation. Um, it has to do with know those numbers. It was like blood pressure 120 over 80, LDL cholesterol... It's in your handout. But aspirin is not for everyone, so it's an individual discussion with your doctor because there's a very small bleeding risk associated with aspirin, um, gastrointestinal bleeding primarily. So not everyone should be on aspirin. It's not like you turn 55 and go on aspirin, no. Um, but it does reduce the risk of clots forming, remember the video, in the heart and in the head. So it reduces heart attack risk and stroke risk. And but it depends on your other risk. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's an individual decision with your doctor. And the third one now, I remember. Um, does cholesterol ever go away? So there are some ultrasound studies where they actually put a little ultrasound camera down people's arteries, their heart arteries, you know, before and after statins, and some of the plaque has gone away. So statins help scrub the plaque and they help stabilize the plaque so it doesn't rupture open. Remember the whole blister analogy? So some people come in having had a heart attack and their cholesterol is normal. And they don't understand why I'm recommending a statin because statins reduce cholesterol and their cholesterol is normal. Well, 
they had other things going on. Statins are anti-inflammatory. Not like Advil is anti-inflammatory, but anti-inflammatory at the level of the vessel, taking cholesterol away. So statins do other things besides just make the numbers on paper look better, which is why they're so amazing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are the statins the only thing that take the plaque away? Can good heart health, you know, things that you do, exercise and eating and so right. on, does that ever reduce the plaque? So I think, wasn't it like Dean Ornish that reverse heart disease or um, Pritkin, you know, this really ultra low fat diet? Um, I'm less familiar with the literature about simply, you know, a heart healthy lifestyle and plaque regression. Obviously, I advocate that. I can't really quote you the literature about like they took 100 people and put them through this intensive lifestyle thing and then their calcium score went down. I don't have that data. Um, it has a lot to do with stabilization of plaque, which is certainly better than progression of plaque. So whenever someone's got plaque, it's a multifaceted. It's not just like, well, now you're on Lipitor, but you can eat at McDonald's every day. No. One, one question. What happens when you have uh, patients who don't tolerate the statins well? And it happens for sure. Um, we have second line drug called azetamibi or zedia, which is not a statin, but it doesn't have the muscle stuff that most that statins do. And by the way, the muscle side effects are in a minority of people, but they do happen. So zedia can lower the LDL cholesterol pretty well. And then there are a new class of drugs that are actually a shot that you have to give yourself that you can imagine are very, very expensive. Very expensive. Um, but in people who have terrible cholesterol, terrible heart disease, can't take statins, they can be on this injectable drug. It's called, it's a PCSK9 inhibitor. But, so we have other options, which is really great, which is really great. Um, but we usually try at least a couple statins before we give up. So is plaque and calcium the same thing? Is plaque calcium? No. no. This is a very good question. Thank you. So we talked a lot about calcium, and we, we looked at that white. It's all mucked up now. We looked at the pictures with, like, the white dots. Okay, that's plaque that's been there long enough to get, like, a little calcium cap on top of it. I don't want to use the word fossilized, but it's sort of more mature plaque. I have a handful of patients who have a calcium score of zero, so there was no white dots in their heart, but they ended up having a heart attack because they had quite a bit of soft plaque, which is kind of newer plaque, baby plaque. And that plaque is actually more prone to rupturing because it doesn't have the, the calcified cap on top of it. So. There's definitely a correlation with the higher your calcium score, the more likely you are to have a cardiac event. And a calcium score of zero is still a really good thing. But there's this little nuance of soft plaque. So that's, I hope that answers the question that that person online had. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I am concerned about the fact that lots of women have heart attacks sort of unpredictably without any symptoms. What kind of screening tests do you think are necessary to sort of find those people hopefully in advance? Like is an EKG enough? Or are there other things that one should routinely have even though they aren't necessarily um, at high risk? Right, good question. Um, that keeps me up at night because I still get upset and surprised when someone comes in with, you know, no, they were perfectly healthy, you know. Um, the mainstay is to have a good relationship with your primary care doctor. Not everyone needs a cardiologist. Um, so having a good primary care doctor who's going to really get into your history and understand your risk. An EKG tells us some information, but not all of the information. But then we start adding pieces of the puzzle, right? We start saying, well, what's your cholesterol? Is it a little borderline? You know, what's your blood sugar? Is it a little borderline? So when we retrospectively look at some of these folks who present suddenly, we end up finding that they had, they had risk factors 
that just hadn't been identified yet. So having a good relationship with your doc, getting the basic screening stuff, like your cholesterol and your blood pressure and your blood sugar, that's easy. Um, then deciding, well, should I have an EKG? Should I have a heart scan? Yeah, you know, someone's dad died at 45 of a heart attack. I'm going to be more worried about that person, right? Because we can't control our genetics. So I guess what I'm saying is having the discussion with your doc or your, or your primary care provider about, well, what really is my risk? And asking, should I have more testing? And then if they feel that they need to send to cardiology to have a further discussion about that, that's great. Um, but I guess I'll say as way of reassurance is sometimes we actually uncover risk factors in these people who were perfectly healthy when we go back into their history. Yeah. Does that help? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ware. Um, amazing. Thank you so much for coming out. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Um, if you remember, please fill out the evaluation. We really appreciate that. Safe travels, and on your way home, think of what vegetables you're going to eat, right? Yes. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you.